Every time our athletes walk into this weight room, they're going to be pushed to the max. Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! The barbell hasn't changed in over 100 years. I can take a, a 25 pound plate and we'll go out on the turf and I'll, I'll have you hating life. We talk about straining your gut, pushing past that comfort level. I want a lot of energy. What better breeding ground is there for being a success in life than the weight room? Hey guys, welcome back to Iron Game Chalk Talk. I'm your host, Ron McKeefrey, and this is episode number 236. I want to thank you guys for listening each week. Really appreciate those of you that like, share, comment. Just helps me continue to highlight the great people that are in our industry. Uh, also want to thank specifically uh, our sponsors and uh, Train Heroic for sponsoring this episode. Uh, you guys know I think the world of Train Heroic, they are top-notch people, first and foremost, and then they have what I believe is the industry standard in um, and programming, it's an online so a software solution. And uh, I think that they're just uh, leaps and bounds to everybody else. And so if you're in that market, uh, please check them out and, uh, and let them know that we sent you. But uh, just a, a great company, great product, and uh, a phenomenal culture. This week, I'm joined by Jeff Kahn. He's, well, Jeff, what is your title with Rice Science? I mean, you're the founder, president? CEO and co-founder. Yeah, CEO and co-founder of Rice Science. And, and uh you know, I reached out to Jeff. He, he they had uh, done a story. I think it was what Oklahoma State or um, I can't remember, but uh, just so very impressed by his company, very impressed by his product, and and uh, you know, for a guy that's getting a lack of sleep quite a bit lately, um, <laughs> I, I just wanted to have him on just so I can learn from him. But Jeff, thanks for coming on, man. Yeah, no, thank you, Ron. I mean, it's I I, I just want to be here to be a resource and um, you know share share what we've learned along the way. Absolutely, man. Well, let's, you know, let's dig into it a little bit. I mean, what's your background? What's kind of the story behind Rise Science? Yeah, so it's, uh, it's a fun one. I uh, grew up in Southern California, sunny Orange County, California, and decided I'd make my way out to uh, Chicagoland area to, to go to school. And I wanted to, I was actually really interested in the healthcare system and put together an engineering degree that was all about how to solve that problem. Uh, you know, being a, a doctor, if you will, of a system, not not being a doctor of, you know, patients. And so that was really interesting to me. And along the way, you know, I'd be up late at night working on math problems, basically. And, you know, then up early in the morning to get to class. And it was, it was you know, a grind, but I loved that stuff and just was super tired in the morning and I could fall asleep in any class. And I was, you know, this is really strange. Why, you know, why do I feel this way? And I've started to get involved in sleep science. I thought I had the answers for what I was feeling and why I was feeling. And I ended up, a uh, fun fact about Chicago is that it's up in school at Northwestern and the first sleep lab ever in the world opened at the University of Chicago in 1925. Wow. So it's something that we've been le learning a lot about and accumulating a lot of knowledge over the past, you know, more than 100 years or around, you know, 100 years or so. And uh, just got to work with some of the best people in that, in that field, some of the best in the world. Uh, and what one of the... Uh, you know, as I started to kind of go through that process, as I started to familiarize myself with the research and, and I, I got really interested, you know, in, in trying to figure out, well, how can we make a difference here? What, how do we create behavior change? What sorts of interventions are effective? What isn't? How do you measure it? And that's where Northwestern football, uh, credit to their head athletic trainer and, and performance staff, found out about the research that I was doing with my now co-founder, Leon, who uh, was studying data science. So we were total engineering nerds. And, uh, and they said, you know, they were humble enough to say, look, our guys are falling asleep in meetings. They're tired that we know they're underperforming. We know they're, they're getting hurt more than they should. You know, can you just help solve that problem for our team? And we'll open up our doors to you. We'll give you all the resources we can. And, um, and that really meant a lot to us. So we took that opportunity pretty seriously. And, um, you know, what we found was absolutely all those guys were not getting enough sleep. Um, but what was really fascinating about that experience, and this was back in uh, 2012, the 2012 season, um, uh, what, what we learned was that, yeah, guys weren't getting enough sleep, but when you dug below the surface and we'd go to their apartments and we'd look at what their days were and we were doing time studies, what we were finding was that the guys weren't sleeping for, for different reasons. So for one guy, it might be he was up late watching Netflix, you know, and time. Uh, for another guy, it might have been he's actually just laying in bed at the right time. He's not able to fall asleep. Uh, for, for another one, it could be, you know, based on what he was eating, and that was a barrier. And so what we found is 
there are basically these different barriers to optimal sleep, which we can talk about. And it was about, um, you know, figuring out what those barriers were and then giving players personal plans to, to improve their sleep. And ultimately, you know, we find that they were improving their performance. Um, yeah. The big work at Northwestern, and you can cut me off here, but we ended up building some software to do that, uh, to basically learn how players were sleeping and give them these personal plans. And what we found through our randomized controlled trials with them was they were sleeping 54 minutes more per night on average. And that led to, because we had all the, the play execution data, uh, that was leading to a 5% increase in play execution per play. Um, now, what that means if you're playing 70 game is, you know, roughly, what, three and a half plays that you're more likely to do your job. Um, you know, we were seeing it correlating to grip strength, uh, cortisol testosterone ratios. Uh, we were doing some really kind of cutting edge work at elite form. So we were looking at how sleep affected uh, velocity-based movement profiles of certain lifts. What we found is, you know, there's there was much more, uh, you know, consistency and there's much more consistency in the velocity profile of full body lifts. Uh, I mean, so we were just finding it in, in any way you could look at an outcome in football performance. We were finding that sleep was this driving factor. And that's where, you know, we decided, okay, this is more than just research, how do we help more players? How do we help more programs, you know, get to get to and build a culture of, you know, healthy sleep and optimal sleep. And that's going to drive performance, you know, in every other aspect of the program. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And, and obviously it was a been a major issue with the teams that I've worked with and, and even myself, if I'm being honest, you know, but before we dig into that, I want to, I want to, you know, just kind of, I think one of the best, questions that we go have on the show and where I learned the most is, um, you know, what's you know, the biggest mistake you've ever made either through your business or with working with a team or, or, or the biggest mistake that you see out there. Um, because I think that, you know, if we can avoid other people's potholes, you know, we can, we can get to where we're, we're trying to go a little bit faster or more efficiently. And so what is, you know, maybe the biggest mistake that you've made in your business career or that you've seen through dealing with sleep? Yeah, you know, I think it's it's moments where, you know, you, at least for me personally, you know, I'm, I'm a really big idea, you know, uh, vision type of thinker. And so for me, it's it's being able to balance that with the discipline. And, and what I've noticed, you know, just to give you an example of kind of in my personal life is the, the, even going back to like, last, you know, to last summer or last winter in Chicago where, you know, I wasn't taking care of my... I wasn't taking care of my body. I wasn't taking care of my, my mental, the, the mental part of what I, you know, my, my performance. And, and I knew the critical inputs into that. I got to get sleep every night. I get eight and a half hours. I'm an eight and a half hour need guy, but I wasn't getting outside. I wasn't eating right. I wasn't moving right. And that when, when I'm not at my, you know, when I don't have that discipline to, to get those inputs, right. The levels of my job, right. Right. I'm just not the best that I can be. And so that, that's, that's really I, what I try and learn from and take inspiration from. What I've learned from working in the profession is the importance of discipline and getting those controllables right. Like you have to do it. And I, so I just feel lucky to have received that wisdom and um, just trying to put that to practice, you know, every day. It was 20 degrees out and I was going for a run on, on, on the lake uh, in Chicago. So there you go. There you go. Well, you know, I, I want to dig into sleep. I mean, obviously, as strength and conditioning coaches, it's it's a you know, uh, there's so many different elements that you're concerned with. You know, strength, power, speed, you know, balance, coordination, skill acquisition, nutrition. You know, sleep is obviously a major part of that. But is you know, is it you know, how important is it? Is it is it a piece of the pie or is it the whole pie? Yeah, um, yeah. So it's it's a really really great question um, you know here's here's how we think about it and, and I've been fortunate to be influenced by just some incredible uh, you know strength conditioning coaches and sports scientists and you know it's it, to the way we really think about this is ultimately what we're going for is performance and it's performance on on game day right that's that's really what we're trying to drive and we think that's really supported by how are you practicing how are you preparing and your performance in those preparations is going to be based on, well, what's your fuel like? What's your nutrition? What's, uh, 
talk to me about your mental preparation. You know, how are you feeling confidence wise? What's your mood state? Um, but then physically, what are, what have you been doing in the weight room? How, where are you at from a periodization standpoint? Are you, you know, where, how, how fast and how agile, how, you know, how quick those, those, those components. And typically what we see is that programs, you know, in, in, in the, the elite programs have typically people and a lot of support behind each of those pillars. Um, and what is underlying all of that, and, and this is our belief scientifically, is that sleep is typically left out. And if it's and it, the reason we believe it is the foundational element is that it actually affects the pillars above it. So you know, just indulge me for a second here. So let's let's talk about nutrition. So there was a landmark study done in, in 2000, um, and what what they found was that just getting five hours of sleep for six nights decreases decreases glucose metabolism by 30 percent which means you're metabolizing your food like someone with diabetes. Right. So what does that mean? If you're, even if you, you're eating the best food in the world and the right times and the right amounts of everything, if your sleep isn't right, it's not doing you any good. Um, and, and then, you know, let's talk about mental preparation, right? What you might know is obviously you've got to break down muscle, you've got to work hard in the, in the weight room to get that to happen. But what a lot of folks don't know is that 95% of your growth hormone is released during your slow wave sleep. So where the muscle rebuilding happening, where, where that rebuilding is happening is during sleep. It doesn't happen when you're awake, when you've, when you've woken up early. So if you're trying to get muscle rebuilding to happen, you need growth hormone to synthesize those fibers, and that's only happening during sleep. Um, you know, think about mental preparation right? A big part of what guys are doing is they're in film, they're on the field, they're, they're trying to install the game plan into their brain so they can go execute on Saturday. Um, and so what, what a lot of people know is you've got to put time into the film room to do that. You've got to put time in the practice field. But where that actually gets cemented into the neurons is, again, during sleep. And sure. so you think about the pillars of performance, what leads to high performance reliably, Sleep is this foundational element. It doesn't go the other way. It's not like film room is helping you sleep. So that's why we really believe it's foundational. And, and to put it simply, you know, if you're trying to achieve your genetic potential, if you're not sleeping optimally, and we can talk about what optimal sleep is scientifically, if you're not sleeping at optimal, there is no way to beat your genetic potential. It, it's, that's, that's just a fact. And so, you know, even some of the best players that we work with in the world, it's, it's not, oh, I'm already great. It's, how can I be the best version of myself? And that's what excites me is working with programs like that, working with individuals like that. That's that. Those are the types of people we try and bring onto our team internally. So that's that's really what's exciting about sleep is it's this unlocking factor. It's not gonna. It doesn't mean you're gonna automatically be at your potential. You got to get all those other pillars right. What's so exciting about working with some of the leading programs and with with some of the leading athletes is they've got all those other areas locked in. It's so right. come in get sleep installed and now they can get take their game to a whole other level sure yeah no i couldn't agree with you more and i love the fact that i love that term foundational element I, um i i think that that's absolutely correct you know with so much of technology and you know and, and some of these external uh, factors that exist it's about education it's about educating the athlete and it's about them you know tr trying to shape a message or provide a framework to, that they understand how important it is because they're, they're doing it outside of the two hours that you have them where you're only focused on the performance piece, right? You know, and yeah. when you talk about the, dis the discipline of optimal sleep, what do you mean by the discipline of optimal sleep? And then how do we educate them and encourage them to want to do it for themselves? Um, yeah, you know, look, I, just to answer your first question on the discipline side of things, one of the biggest problems that we see and, and one of the things that we're consistently educating about is you know when we come into a team it's not like those players don't know how important sleep is. they know that when they get more sleep they feel better again we can talk about the specific numbers behind that but so many guys know that and so the key part of this is how do we equip them with the tools to be self-aware to ultimately have that discipline to get what, what, what optimal sleep looks like so right. for the majority of the guys we work with, it's, and think about your own life, you know, you, have, you go through a long day, you're, you know, draining your willpower along the day, 
another topic that's close to my heart. Um, but you're, you're going throughout your day, and by the end of it, you just want to relax. You want to wind down. And it becomes very difficult then to, to be disciplined and then put your head on the pillow at the right time. And so for most of the, you know, at the professional level and at the collegiate level, and even non-athletes, what the, one of the biggest problems is what we call sleep procrastination, where you, you, know, you get home, you might even have a time in your head, you know, yeah, around midnight seems good, you know, get six hours a night, whatever it is, but then it's a couple hours past your target time, and you know, now you've just cut your sleep short. And it's right. that process over time that really has a, uh, you know, negative impact on, on human performance. Yeah, I think, you know, that, that becomes that self-awareness piece is, is a critical factor. And I think, you know, if you're armed with information to be at HRV or heart rate or whatever it may be, um, you know, you have to put, um, I think you have to shape the path, right? You have to, you have to provide an environment in which they want to, um, to, uh, achieve those results, you know, and, and so I guess I, I guess you know you, you give four steps to a successful sleep program. What are those? What are those four steps to kind of shape that environment? Um, and uh, and then you know what should they expect from that? Yeah, you know, and this is really geared towards. I'm, I'm these these steps are things we've learned along the way. You know, again as as researchers, and now we've transitioned to you know working with a number of of elite programs, and we've been fortunate to to work with with many and. Um, so this is just something we've been able to, to observe over time. But the, the, first, the first step is that these guys are already taxed. Everyone's taxed. Like, this has to be easy. It's got to be what Chip, Chip Morton and Jeff Friday told me. It's got to be at the third grade level. And I don't think that just applies to athletes. I think everything should be at the third grade level. If right. you can't explain it that simply, then you're, you're typically not doing something right. Um, and so, so, you know, how, did, how is this a third grade level? Is it that simple that a thir your third grader is going to be like, oh, sleep more, perform better? You know, it's got to be very, very simple. Um, it also, it, the, the programs can't require staff time. You don't have a sleep scientist on staff. Like, it, it's got to be, it just got to be able to kind of run itself. And there's got to be, I mean, think about in, in, in helping anyone develop any skill, there's got to be personal feedback. So just, you know, what we've seen along the way is we've done randomized controlled trials on does sleep education, uh, does that change behavior? Does that change sleep behavior? Do people sleep more optimally after education? And what we've learned by studying this is that, no, it doesn't actually change. So while it might feel good and while it's certainly no risk, um, it doesn't actually get the desired results and adaptation that we, that we want to see. Um, so it's important that there's a personal level of communication. And then you've got to have, again, in the same way that you, you got in, in the weight room, like you've got to have objective numbers you're trying to hit. Because when you measure something, then you can, you can see improvement against that. So in, you know, without, without those elements, it becomes, becomes difficult. So what I would encourage everyone to be thinking about at any level, whatever you're thinking with sleep, is to say, is it hassle-free? you know, yes or no, or, or a spectrum within that, how much time is it going to take for me and, and my players to do? Is there going to be an element of personal feedback here? And are we getting objective numbers? Um, and, and sort of that's the, that, the, the four criteria by which you can sort of judge and, and start to use to design what you think is going to be an effective program. With the athletes, when you're educating the athletes or a client, you know, as to setting up that, that optimal sleep environment, you know, what, do, what are we looking for there? What, what, I mean, you know, we've always heard the eight hours. We've always heard, you know, a uh, cool room. We've, you know, no, no blue yep. light, you know, all those types of things. What, I mean, what do we not know that's, that's a, a factor? Yeah. So we're just going to start off with, with the, big, the big ideas here. So if you care about performance, um, there's only two factors you care about with sleep. And it's actually, it's, it's been in the research since uh, the late seventies. It's called the two factor model of sleep. And the idea is that your performance any given day is based on what's called your sleep need. So actually everyone has a different amount of sleep they need for optimal performance the next day. Um, we've seen that number. There was a receiver at Tennessee that needed 11 hours. Uh, but we've worked with some players that, and that that's extreme on the on the high end. And we've worked with some that you know are down at the six and a half end. Um, 
the reason you've heard eight hours is there, there's the average in the population is slightly over eight, but it's the normal distribution. So just like height, weight, and all the genetic differences, um, you can see that with sleep. So it's how much, what's your sleep need? Um, and then the other element is uh, what time you're actually getting your sleep. So as you age, um, and, and genetically everyone's also different, but as you age, there's actually a sleep window where if you sleep within that window, you're going to be getting better sleep. And if you perform in certain windows, you're actually going to be getting, you're going to be performing better. And that's based off of the circadian rhythm. Um, so we care about both those factors. So again, let's go back to kind of the eight hours idea. So is eight hours good? Well, it depends on what you need. Um, you know, imagine telling, you know, a group of, you know, your, your student athletes, your, your pro athletes that, you know, Hey, the average bench press for a pro athlete is 285 pounds repped X times. Some guys it's going to be too easy. Some guys it's going to be way too hard, but like, it doesn't right. make sense. Right. So, so that, that type of feedback is that, that can be harmful in a lot of ways. So what, what we help our, you know, what we help our teams do is identify what each player needs. Um, but then we know that the, the factor that affects performance isn't just how much you got the night before relative to your need. It's actually a factor called sleep debt. So the general idea, just to put this super simply, is it works kind of like bank debt. You know, you let's say you're an eight-hour guy um, and you get seven hours for five nights leading into your Saturday game. Well, you're going to have, you know, because you needed eight and you've got seven, night one, you're accruing one hour of sleep debt. Night two, you're adding another. So by the time you get to your game, five nights later, you've got five hours of sleep debt. Your performance is based on your sleep debt, not how much you slept the night before. Mm -hmm. So that debt you can carry around 40 hours, roughly speaking, and it's roughly around uh, a month window. So you know, the, the, where this gets tricky is, again, every individual player is going to, or every individual human has a sensitivity to sleep and they also have a certain decay function. And, and so that, that stuff gets fun. We can talk about that too, but, uh, but that's the general idea. So right. when you think about anything, let's think about, you know, environment, why is environment important or mattress or pillows or think about any intervention to sleep. What we care about analyzing it against is, is it going to increase the amount of total sleep time versus right. the amount of sleep you need? Um, and is it going to optimal, optimally put you into your sleep window? If it does one of those things, you're going to see performance increase. If it doesn't do those things, you're not, you should not expect a, a performance change based on all the science that's been done. Right. So, for example, you know, people are going out and spending lots of money on mattresses. That's kind of all the, the you know, there's a lot of uh, advertisement around that. And the idea, I mean, we've been in some places where players are waking up a lot in the night because their mattresses are so bad. Um, now, in a case like that, again, why is that bad from first principles? It's bad because you're getting less sleep because you're, you're up at night. You're not spending right. as much time in the sleep cycle. Um, but it's not because there's some, you know, it's not like if you buy a better mattress with different foam, you're somehow getting magically, like, you know, more efficient at sleep. Um, the general idea is the brain is actually self-optimizing for the type of sleep, how much REM you're getting, how much deep, how much stage two, how much stage three. And so another thing that we see all the time that causes a lot of confusion is this idea of like, you know, oh, I need to maximize REM sleep or I need to get deep sleep. Every stage is critical. Every right. stage is possible for a different aspect of the development. And so we're trying to maximize total time asleep. That's the key factor. Uh, right. that's, those are just some of the things that, you know, we talk about. But when you talk about that sleep need, and let's say let's say it's, you know, forty hours a week, you know, or you know um, that you you're, that you need for game day or whatever, is it? Yep. I mean, can it be as is? Is there a way to, when it comes to performance on game day, you know, let's just say it was a five day week, it was forty hours, could you yeah. not sleep the first day, get forty hours the next, you know, ten hours the next four days, and be okay for performance? Yeah, so, so roughly speaking, what we know is that, yes, you, you can absolutely make up sleep debt. Um, and that's a really important thing, which means that you can, uh, but you have to actually make it up, right? right. Like, let's say 40 hours deep in sleep debt, and then and this is something that happens all the time. A player will sleep 12 hours on the weekend. 
So one, they'll feel like super tired when they wake up. That's called a sleep hangover, and it's actually uh, largely due to a change in the testosterone cortisol ratio, which we right. can talk about. So that's called a sleep hangover. But one of the things is they've got 40 hours of sleep debt, and now they've got maybe they needed eight hours, so they just paid back four hours. So now they're at 36 hours. So it's not like performance is going to magically change overnight. It's it takes continuous work against that against your sleep debt to right. keep that. In. And so that's really what we're working on managing. Yeah, I think that that's the big challenge is because there is, it's just like, uh, you know, like work-life balance, right? There's, you know, work-life balance doesn't exist. I mean, there, there's no way it's going to be a 50-50 deal, you know? Uh, and so you go through periods of time. We're just like, I think with coaching, the coaches that are listening to this and as well as players where there may be some nights that I get four hours sleep and there may be some, you know, there may be, you know, an opportunity where I'm able to bank, you know, 10 hours on the, on the front end, yeah. you know? Um, you know, what, what advice do you have, um, for those coaches? You know, I, I think most people, if, if given the opportunity, they would, they would try to sleep those eight hours and all that. Um, what, what, what's your, you, you talked a little bit earlier about the player that, you know, would sit in bed and just couldn't fall asleep, you know, uh, you know, that, that would had trouble getting to sleep. Some yep. of that, some of that is just, you know, creating a habit you know, obviously, but the other part of that is, you know, there is a good portion of people that just, that just can't get to sleep for whatever reason. What, what advice yeah. do you have for those people? Yeah. You know, it, it's roughly, so, so those people, it's between, you know, 10 to 15% of the population. And, and we see that similar on teams and a couple of things that you can do for sure. Uh, you know, one thing is particularly, this is important with the younger athletes is that at age 20, is the latest you will ever be biologically from a sleep standpoint. That means that everyone's heard of melatonin at this point. Melatonin is the sleep hormone. So when I say late, what I mean is that naturally under dim light, the brain actually has a time that it releases melatonin into the bloodstream to get the body ready for sleep. And so when, when you're at age 20, on average, that's the latest you will ever be. So, you know, 12, 1, 2 a.m., 3 a.m. is actually normal at that time for a lot of those, a lot of those student athletes. Now, as wow. you get older, it goes earlier and earlier. So, you know, getting up at 5 a.m. as you get older is actually, that's, that's optimal for a lot of coaches that are, you know, in their 50s, 60s. You know, but for these guys that are at, at, at age 20, it's actually biologically, um, you know, not at the right, it's disadvantageous to, to, to do that. So a lot of them are trying to go to bed at 10 but their brain is trying to get them to go to bed at 2 a.m. Right. So for a lot of the players we work with, it's that. So we have to get really specific with how we do what's called chronotherapy, but get lighting at the right times um, to help shift that rhythm. You, you, so you've got to get creative there, and you've got to get really disciplined with your wind-down routine. And, but in general, if, if you are in your bed and you're not able to fall asleep and you're thinking, two things. One, get out of bed. Uh, you don't want to build an association with your bed of not being able to sleep. So literally get out, get completely out of the room, you know, keep, make sure your lights are dim, but, but go do something relaxing. And then when you're sleepy again, get back in bed and go to sleep. Don't worry about it. Again, you know, one of the things we've messaged the athletes all the time is, you know, because your performance is based on your sleep debt, there's, a, uh, there, there's, it's a double edged sword on the right. upside. You know, let's say you do have a night where you get two hours of sleep. If you've been sleeping well and taking care of your sleep debt, you're going to play just fine. Now, the opposite is true. Let's say you haven't been taking care of business and the night before the game, you're getting 12 hours of sleep. You're, you're still going to be not playing that well. You're Based on sleep alone, you're not going to be performing that well. Right. So it's sort of the same thing is true. Like one night isn't going gonna, isn't gonna to hurt you. It's, you know, open your view to the past month. What have your habits been? And that's what's going to be, you know, that debt is going to be what's predictive of your, your performance that day. Um, so get out of bed and then, you know, write down your thoughts, like get right. out a notepad, write them down. And, and by doing that, it actually quiets those thoughts. There's a psychological principle behind that. Uh, but yeah, that's a good idea. I haven't, I haven't heard that one. I, I, you know, I, you sometimes you get caught up in the whole mindfulness and, you know, those types of things. And I think there's a place, but at the same time, I mean, especially when you're 20 years old, I don't know if you got the maturity to have true mindfulness you know but yeah it's hard to be truly mindful uh, but uh there's well, some, some advice. well obviously rise science has, has come up with some solutions you know uh, you know be it products or be it services to kind of be an assistance to this process what are what are some of the, the, the what are some of those products and solutions 
Yeah, you know, the main thing we offer is, is, is sleep improvement for teams. So, you know, what we've learned is, look, it, just like I mentioned, like the, 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 you got to go back to the foundation. Like it's got to be so easy that players don't have to think about it and they're getting personal feedback and their objective sleep numbers. And so, you know, based on that, we do have, uh, we do have an app that the players use. It gives them personal feedback. We identify their sleep need. We tell their sleep debt. Um, all of that, and ultimately, what we see there is, you know, we want to see a player that's going from from if he's getting six, we want to see him go to seven. If he's getting seven, we want to see him go to eight. We want to increase that sleep total sleep time versus how much they need. So ultimately, right. it's how we drive sleep debt, you know, to a minimum. Um, and then there's a couple tools. Again, these are all tools we give the, we give the players to be self aware and ultimately build a culture around this. And uh, you know, Clemson, one of our one of our uh, customers. There's a great piece. It's, uh, the link is on our Twitter, but just to hear you know Dabo talk about the importance of sleep and, and how it's part of their culture. It's part of what it means to to perform, and you know that's really where we believe things are going. And Oklahoma State, you know, same thing. Rock Blasts, uh, you know, just an incredible proponent, Mike Gundy, and those guys are really leading the way in terms of how they think about player performance. And when you see those cultures, when you see those guys, the level of buy-in they have to understand the science for themselves, it's, it's just incredible to, to, to see. And so then they bring it on themselves and now it just becomes part of what they do. It's part of, you know, now they're thinking about sleep debt in the same way they're thinking about, you know, what they're doing on the field and what they're eating and what they're doing in the weight room. And so starting to just build that culture is, is really for us what success looks like, where these guys feel that they've got a new superpower. They have a new lever on their performance and right. that's what we want to um, so, you know, right now, exclusively focused on, on team sports. Um, you know, we got our start in football, but obviously we do work in the NBA. You know, we do work in almost every major league now and, and most conferences. And uh, so on, on that side, that's what we do. But again, it comes down to the core of, you know, every player. We want to take care of sleep as the foundation. We want to help give them the tools to be self-aware. And, and that's going to drive, you know, that change we want to see. and ultimately you know, we'll see huge performance increase. Um, so that's, that's kind of what we, what, what we're interested in. Oh, it's awesome. Well, man, we, this has been great. What we end the show with some resources here. What's uh, the best piece of coaching advice you ever received? <laughs> so I, I mentioned it slightly alluded to it, but um, back when I was doing some early work with uh, the Bengals and Jeff Friday and Chip Morton, they said, Jeff, you know, you understand the science and you know that like the back of your hand, but, you know, everything, and they're like, this is more of a life lesson than anything. Everything you do, can you simplify it to the third grade level, right? Can you make it simple? Can you, can you do that? And so that's, that's been a big part of our ethos, and it's been a big part of, you know, my ethos coming from a scientific background and transitioning to one where, you know, we're, we're interacting with non-scientists all the time. You just got to simplify it. And, um, and so that's, that's just been a huge lesson and, and just thankful to have received that wisdom. A book, app, website recommendation? Yeah, on the book side, so I, I really, really am excited around the research around willpower. And uh, Roy Baumeister is, is one of the leading scientists there and, and wrote a book called, called Willpower. I'd recommend that. Um, huge fan of just how, thinking about the biases of the mind. Um, thinking fast and slow, Daniel Kahneman. Yeah. Unbelievable uh, work and inspiration there. And then on the sleep side, um, you know, I go back to a book called The Promise of Sleep by, by Bill DeMent. He's sort of the grandfather of sleep science. Um, and he, I think the, book, the book's, you know, it's, it's years old now at this point, but just gives such a great overview of, of the entire uh, kind of sleep sphere, if you will. So by reading that, you'll probably know more than, than 99% of the people uh, in the country. So uh, it's a good read. Awesome. Website now. Um, so website, uh, for me, it's like, I, I try and actually limit my, my website usage, uh, with this app I use. So I'll link this together with, with another app called hours Okay. and what hours does, and it's more, I have to get into the process, but every morning I set my to-do list. Here are the things I need to get done today. And then I group them into different priorities. So I know this week I might want to spend 50% of my time, um, you know, bringing on someone new to the rise team. 
I want to spend 25% of my time doing sleep science research. I want to spend 25% of my time and I'll, I'll segment that out. And then I use the, the app on my Apple watch to actually, when I start that task, I use the hours app. I clock into basically that part of my priority. So I know, you know, by the end of the week, did I do that or not? Am I, am I spending right. my time in alignment with what my priorities are? And I've just found that to be helpful to stay focused. Yeah, it's great. Is it a, is it a web app as well, or is it? Just um, a, it's a, it is a web app, but the iPhone app and Apple Watch app is free. Uh, so I just use, I just use that and highly recommend. It. Like it's on my like Apple Watch face, and like I use it for everything, and highly recommend highly recommend it for kind of keeping track of your time and what you spending your time doing. Well, I think you know, as strength coaches, to be a, a great strength coach, to be you know somebody that. Uh, to be the resource to these athletes that they need, we have to have a wealth of experts that we can call upon. And, and obviously, you know, uh, as, as a strength coach, I just want to say thanks for doing, you know, this type of research to, to create these types of resources and tools uh, because, you know, we don't have the time. We just don't have the time to go. And each one of those, you know, components of athleticism, to deep dive like that. But, you know, thank God we got guys like you that are doing it and just, um, Really appreciate the way that you're going about your business, the, the resource that you're being, and uh, and then how you're making a difference in these athletes' lives, which is ultimately what we're in it all for. So thanks for coming on the show, man. Yeah, appreciate you. That's it for this episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk. Thanks to this week's guest as well as our sponsors for bringing this episode to you for free. Make sure to check out ronmckeefree.com where you can join our mailing list, find the show notes, including all the links and resources mentioned, and information about Coach McKeefree's other products. While you are there, please join Coach McKeefree in the comments section thanking our guest for sharing. If you haven't subscribed to Iron Game Chalk Talk on YouTube or iTunes yet, make sure to do so. Comments, ratings, and reviews are always welcome. Coach McKeefree can be found on Twitter at rmckeefree on Facebook and YouTube at forward slash Ron dot McKeefer. That's it for this week. Be sure to check back next week for another great episode of Iron Game Shop Talk.